So welcome to another episode of Wikipedia Weekly. I'm your host, Andrew Lee, also known as user Fuzzhedo on the English Wikipedia. So thank you again for joining us on this episode. We are thrilled to have Emily Temple Wood, who is one of the uh, most perfect Wikipedians that you'll ever meet. Uh, and we'll also have Rob Fernandez, who will join us as one of the folks who uh, is a librarian in the movement. But before we get to that, just want to remind you that you're probably watching this one on one of four different platforms. This is using a tool called StreamYard, which goes to Facebook Live, uh, Twitter, and Periscope, and also YouTube, and Twitch if you're into gaming. So you are using a tool to watch us on one of those four platforms, hopefully and you can actually talk back to us. So any comments that you send back on the platform of your choice, we can see and we can surface some of those comments coming back. Like uh, Jim Hay says, happy birthday. Thank you, Jim. So that is an example of how we can surface those comments. And if you want your name and your face to show on our comments here on Facebook, at least, go to streamyard.com slash Facebook, and we can actually see your identity here rather than just a, a generic, uh, label that goes up there. So I want to encourage you, if you are a Facebook user, you're probably seeing this in our Facebook group, but anyone else is welcome to join us in that Facebook group. It is um, facebook.com slash group slash Wikipedia Weekly. We also have a Twitter account, Wikipedia Weekly, where the Periscope feed is. And there's also a YouTube channel if you look up Wikipedia Weekly there. So please subscribe, tell other folks about it, retweet. Uh, we got many platforms and many ways to get the word out. So without further ado, let's get to our guest for this podcast. And we are thrilled to have uh, Emily Temple Wood. Welcome, Hi. Emily. Hey, everybody. And Emily, Emily Temple Wood, if you've seen this podcast in the past, has been one of the folks that has been my partner in crime for some of those years. Uh, and this is just great to have her back. And you're in a whole different phase of your life and different phases of a comedian. We'll talk more about that. And we also have Rob Fernandez. Hi, Hello. Rob. Hi, Rob. Hello. And Rob is a uh, academic librarian in Maryland in the Washington DC area. And Emily, Rob and I have done lots of things this movement together, but this is one of the more unique things where <laughs> we cannot physically ever meet Maybe not for 2019. I mean, not for 2020. 2020. We'll see what happens in the future years. But uh, I thought this is a great time to check in with Emily because Emily um, has had so many things going on in her life. <laughs> and what do you think is the yeah. biggest event that's happened in the last year for you? For me personally? Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, I got married and I matched yeah, into I, I was hoping you'd say you got married. So <laughs> I did get married. Uh, Oh dang! You should have warned me. I would have screen shared a wedding picture, but uh, <laughs> you still can. I could, um, I could screen share the one of uh, you and me and some other people at my wedding. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll find those when uh, Rob is talking. Um, hello. Who do you think that is? Hi, M from Nevada City, I California. I am assuming it's my dear Rosie. Yes, oh, yeah, yes, she's that's me. right. Yeah. All right. Uh, Hi, Rosie. So Rosie is also the co twenty sixteen Wikimedian of the Year. With Emily. It feels like a really long time ago, I'm just saying. Yeah, the yes. pandemic will do that to you. It feels like it's 2024. <laughs> it's been a really long month. <laughs> yes, it's been a long month, and you know, so much has happened. And I think when you, we first started talking, what was it, 2011? Was that nine years, 10 years ago? No, not 2011, because I was. Or 2013. Around. 2013. I was off the project. It was 2013, yeah. So that's right. been, you know, seven years that's no no big um <laughs> but yeah you you took a picture of me that is uh i believe still a meme in several places <laughs> uh, several private places on the internet so yeah there you go yeah um, so yeah, I've, been, what... I've been involved plus and minus over the past uh however many years it's been since 2007 13 years Right, right. And I have told this story a number of times, but I think we haven't told on this podcast for a long time. Oh, have, we, have we not? <laughs> I don't think so, because something that might be interesting to you is that um, when I first met Emily in 2013, I think it is, so it's eight mm -hmm. years ago or seven or eight years ago, um, you know, we used to do this podcast from 2006 to 2010. 
as yeah. just audio. You know, they didn't have all this technology to do um, video broadcasting the same way that we have now. And apparently mm -hmm. Emily was a listener. So oh, yeah. when I first met Emily <laughs> face to face for the first time, I honestly, I didn't even know who the heck Emily Templewood was, but we were at yeah. this, um, oh, yeah, we're at this uh, camp, a glam camp in Washington, DC. And Emily comes up to me uh, and she goes, oh my God, you do the Wikipedia weekly podcast. I used uh -huh. to listen to you riding a bike to school every day. I did, every I did. And, and I was like, what? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, you were, what, how old were you then? 19? 13. Well, you're 19 when I met you, so you were listening when oh, you were 13. Yeah, you right? were 19. You I was 19 when you I was an adult, but barely. Right. Um so I would just like to yeah. present this photo, including you, me, my husband, and Rosie <laughs> at my wedding. <laughs> oh, yeah. that's great. Yeah, there's a Aww. and yeah, uh, James the, Sarah the, and Eddie Earhart. So Good times. It it's just so weird to see people together in a place like yeah. that. You're just not used to seeing people together anymore. Back when we were allowed yeah. to do that. Yeah. Don't on each other. Oh my, oh yeah. my gosh. But yeah, and so people, I, I want to make sure people are welcome to comment and to add comments, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook. We can surface some of those um, on the screen as well. Yeah, it's just so weird to see gatherings Aww. of Wikimedians in the same physical space. We're, you know, the story like, that you just told, it's funny because I remember you telling this story the first time I met you guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 2015 or 2016. Yeah, because you came on stage at Wiki Conference North America. Back right. when we had conferences. Back when we had conferences in person and we didn't just live on Zoom. <laughs> um, thank you for the awe. I appreciate it. Yeah, and that was so funny because um, not only did Emily say, I was I was a teenage kid, you know, yeah. listening to the podcast, riding my bike to school. And I said, oh, my God. And <laughs> the funny thing is, the next sentence she said was, it's always been my dream to be on the Wikipedia Weekly podcast. It, legit. And that's it was what I said. <laughs> that's what I said. Girl, you well, need better dreams. All your dreams are coming true this year. I did. I, all of my childhood <laughs> dreams have come true. Every single one of them. And I moved on to my adult dreams. And that's true. And, and what's been the amazing thing is even back then, when you were not even graduating from college, you your ambition was to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. And now you're on the precipice of going from your studies and your two. To, yeah, family medicine residency. Family so that's, that's amazing. Yeah, I have, I have applied for my medical license, which is really <laughs> weird. And what a time to be entered yeah, into that. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. I'm just starting my intern year in the middle of the apocalypse. This is fine. <laughs> so it's fine. It's fine. I mean, and, and what the the strange <laughs> thing is that you know you, you've had so many different kind of phases of your Wikipedia um, engagement. Whether it is the early teen years, from your you know the, your first edit was making fun of your sister, uh, which is famous. That. Yeah. <laughs> And I think it was is it next is like close to that picture that you just showed. I actually got to meet your sister, Sophie, you right? She was so, uh, in there somewhere. <laughs> so I got to meet the person you wrote about in your first <laughs> edit to Wikipedia to vandalize Wikipedia, but eventually became Wikimedian of the Year. So that was pretty cool to see. Even even you two can go from vandalism to <laughs> not riches. Definitely not riches, but to fame you know. at least. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Fame, but not fortune. Yeah. That's kind of the Wikipedia story. Fame-ish. Fame-ish. Negative <laughs> fortune. See list with the negative fortune of someone who's graduating from medical school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but one of the things that Emily is also famous for is the women scientists push. And it's amazing that even though I think, you know, you're not doing so much editing the women scientists now, you, that move has inspired a whole generation of folks on the net whether they're professors or, um, you know, different types of editathons now doing women scientists. So how does it feel to know that you, you tipped over the first domino for a lot of that? I mean, that feels really good, especially because I have not had the time to write as many biographies as I, as I used to. Um, I'm not a college student. I don't have like <laughs> infinite time right. uh, the way that I used to. I, I will explain that in a moment. Uh, <laughs> um, so it's been good to see other people carry that torch because that's the foundation of Wikimedia, right? None of us do this alone. Right. If any of us attempted to do this alone, we would be like Unabomber level crazy in our basements. Um, 
but it's through collaboration. Give it a couple right? months after this pandemic. Right, we'll right. Like um, but it's through like collaboration and inspiration and idea sharing that we can make a make a really big impact. So it's not just me, which is awesome. Um, my first edit was where I created a page somewhere. I don't remember what it was called, but it said Sophie Templewood is a butthead to some degree. Uh, she was the worst. I stand by that. She's a nurse now. She's an ER nurse uh, oh, wow. in Milwaukee. I didn't know that. Yeah. How's she, uh, she doing right now? I, she's okay. I'm very worried about her, but she's so far so good. She's got enough. They have enough PPE and enough ventilators for now. So oh, we'll cool. see. Oh, yeah, she did. She stole her stuffed animal. She stole my stuffed animal and she did kick me. Uh, she <laughs> was butthead. <laughs> but now we're, now we're close, you know, doctor and nurse. Yeah, that's amazing. And do she doesn't seem to be bothered by the fact that I came up to her and goes, You're Sophie, you're a butthead. Yeah. <laughs> and she was like, very good, good, good natured about that. So. I mean, she's used to it. Uh, <laughs> um but yeah i do write about i read about what uh women's health i read about reproductive health um you know I, I work in abortion care so i write about that when i can stomach the crazy um which is kind of rough sometimes but i i do try to write about the lighter side of reproductive health as well uh death during consensual sex remains one of my more popular articles um <laughs> You know, and now I've shifted to writing about, you know, COVID. And even though I'm currently working as a medical, like I'm working as a medical assistant, um, you know, as an essential healthcare worker, I do have time to contribute to Wikipedia. Um, so it's just another phase of my wiki life, I guess. Well, I couldn't let that go without uh, showing you this is one of the articles. This is Emily's an awesome article and I'm really proud of very it. Very proud of. Tell us how, how this got started. Oh boy, this is a Glam Camp special, I think. Oh no. Uh, it was, yeah. Sorry, Glam Camp. You should go to Glam Camp. It's great. You'll learn about all sorts of things. <laughs> this is not one of them. Um, it was a very classic Wikipedia moment, right? We were all sitting in the lobby of the hostel where we were staying, and we got to goofing around and talking. And somehow the concept of, like, I wonder if we have a list where everybody who died, you know, having sex. <laughs> You know, like, does that is that a thing? And it should be a thing. A little bit of Googling, a little bit of Wikipedia digging later, we found out no. So naturally, we had to create it. And I think four or five of us stayed up all night writing this. Right. I was responsible for mostly the uh, physiology part of it. How exactly <laughs> does one die in the saddle, as one says. Um, but, you know, we all kind of pitched in and it, it gets like occasionally shows up on like weird podcasts or lists of weird Wikipedia articles. Right. Which is delightful. Yeah. This is the great thing. Well, maybe not great is not the right word to use, but for good or for <laughs> ill, this is one of the, the effects that Wikipedia has on the world that if you can think of something, it's not just a party game for you and your friends. You can make it happen. You can <laughs> put it out to the world for good or ill. <laughs> this is for good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I forever have a non-lame, like, fun fact about myself for all of the medical school icebreakers that I've had to do. You know, it's like, oh, I wrote this Wikipedia article about death during consensual sex, and that kind of hard to top that. It's real hard to top that, but it also <laughs> it's way less boring than like I went to college in Chicago. Like, right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, everyone should have that. We should have that one Wikipedia article where we can use as an icebreaker. Like, I did this terrible thing. Yeah, I mean, I also did a couple of particularly horrifying ones that tend to freak out uh, medical doctors. But there was one time I was in the working in the ER for one of my rotations and a patient. Uh, I'm not sure how, how blue I can get, but she was barfing poop. And that was like a bad time, and I was like, "Oh, I wrote the Wikipedia article on this." The, the, really? this, this is a phenomenon that has a name. What the poop barfing? Yeah, yeah it's called feculent vomit or fecal vomiting. Of course, of course, there's a. Name it's a bad. It. It's a bad time. It's a bad sign. You you don't want that to happen. You're having a very bad day. <laughs> I bet you not too many doctors ever said, "I you know what, 
not only having that problem, mm. I wrote the article about it too. I didn't so. say to the patient due to <laughs> sh- were, they were too busy, you know, barfing. But I did right. tell the resident I was on with, and he was like, "It's four in the morning, my dude. I can't." I was like, "Okay, that's fair." <laughs> I'm glad well, there's no I think picture one of the... on the article. I'm glad there's no picture on it. That's I mean, all I have just... to say. I mean, it looks like exactly what you would imagine. Mm. I guess this is what happens when you're at the end of your medical school training. Like this, talk of this doesn't phase you at all. You've seen so much. It's just. No, I rotated through the Cook um... County Medical Examiners. Any kind of fear or gross out that I've that I could have had is now gone. Right. Well, speaking of which, I think you Sorry. are one of the best people to talk to Sorry, regarding the COVID-19 why. content that we have <laughs> on Wikipedia right now, because not only do we have someone who knows this stuff from a medical standpoint, you've actually been engaged with a project kind of in parallel to Wikipedia. We've seen this with some other folks in the community. So tell a bit about the coronavirus newsletter that you've worked on and, and yeah. what you learned in doing that. So a couple of weeks ago, I started a newsletter for really just for my friends and family about the the pandemic. Um, I put it up on Tumblr. I made a WordPress site for it, and it got really popular really fast. And it became very very unsustainable because I was tabulating um, like case counts and laws and um, initiatives for like 50 countries. It wasn't 50 countries, but it felt like it. Um, so. About a week ago, I put that on pause and started just contributing to Wikipedia instead. Um, and it really underscored for me the um, <laughs> thanks for showing death during consensual sex again. So <laughs> this was my newsletter. It is currently on hiatus slash pause because I can't anymore. Um, and it really underscored for me the value of Wikimedia um, and the value of not just collaboration, but centralization in disseminating information. Because um, if you'll give me one second, I can pull up um, a representative Wikipedia article. Um, please stop showing me the how to screen share situation. Thank you. Um, so this is the article on the uh, pandemic in Illinois, my home state, Natch. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the articles look like this, and I'm not going to like dunk on any specific article. Everybody's like doing their best to tabulate thousands and thousands of cases, and like it, there's not a ton of people. So all of these articles have been, in classic Wikipedia fashion, like cobbled together, right? Mm-hmm. I've been editing current events articles since Benazir Bhutto fascinated in either 2007 or 2008. Um, which makes me feel old, but I was a teenager, so this is fine. Um, These articles come together bit by bit as bits of news are kind of dropped out. Um, And that leads to a very cohesive final product. Um, So there's the challenge here is twofold for any of these given articles. So for example, this article in Illinois, your first challenge is making sure that you have the most up-to-date information, which in a pandemic changes daily. And your second challenge is making it actually like a functional thing for your reader, not just in terms of what are they getting the most accurate information, but are they also getting the most up-to-date information in a way that is like comprehensible to your average reader. So um, would it be interesting to like go through this and what's good and what's bad about this right now? Would you find that Absolutely. interesting? Absolutely. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So this feels very much like one of my favorite games to play with my best friend when we're driving is where we read each other Wikipedia articles and often end up live editing. It's great. Um, <laughs> Who's so driving? All, <laughs> me. I'm driving. I'm driving. She's reading. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're like dictating edits to her and she'll edit? Occasionally. Yeah. Like yesterday. Wow. This is, um, she's my coworker. So we commute. Um so I, I, we carpool to minimize public transit um, mm-hmm. usage. So yesterday she was reading to me about uh, wormian bones, which are extra bones that people have in their skull. And I was like, no, you need to fix that. And I like <laughs> handed her my phone where I was logged in and like made her change it. <laughs> so um, anyways, so 
all these articles start out the same, right? Saying, you know, the 2020 coronavirus pandemic in place is part of the ongoing worldwide pandemic of coronavirus disease 2019. And I have some feelings mm -hmm. about calling it coronavirus pandemic, like it really should be COVID-19 pandemic, but that's fine. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like getting into that big argument. So the next part of this article we have is talking about when it began, who was the index case, um, how does it compare to the cases in the rest of the country? Um, any notable facts about that case? So the first known case of human-to-human -human transmission in the U.S. And then when we discovered community transmission. And then this should be the most up-to-date data. So at some point I will put in, like, as of April 7th, whatever. So this is actually a really good intro. Um, this is a terrible phrasing, but this is you know, good information, like this is the firsts that have happened in Illinois, and this is how the state has responded to it. So this is a really good intro, and I hope that other states' articles are mi mirroring this. The other thing is that these um, maps, there's been a whole discussion going on, particularly relating to California over the past couple of days, by which I mean it's been me and a couple other people talking about the best way to represent cases, mm. because this is not a good representation of cases in Illinois. It, yes, is it worst in Cook County? Yes. Mm -hmm. But a lot of these counties have like 5,000 people in them. Right. So, so these are absolute not, numbers. They're not per capita. Right. Oh. So there's, there's multiple ways that we talk about per capita cases in medicine. So there's incidents, there's prevalence, um, you know, there's incidents over a particular period. And in a pandemic like this, there's a couple of useful numbers. Um, the first one would be total case, like cumulative cases per 100,000 people. Mm -hmm. um, so that's incidents. Prevalence, we don't get into until something has been happening for a long time because it's like the number of people that currently have the thing and are living with it. So like, it's useful to talk about in terms of like with HIV AIDS, what's the incidence? So the number of new cases per population per year and prevalence is the number of people who have it at any given time. Um, the other useful thing that I think Spain was one of the first countries I saw to first start doing it, I'm sure someone else also has been doing it, but talk about the number of new cases per 100,000 population over the past two weeks. Wow. So kind of averaging over the most recent time period to see what the number of new people affected is. So I would really like to see a push and I'm unfortunately, my skills are limited to Microsoft Paint Yes, the Netherlands did this too. Um, and the, yeah, the Netherlands also switched to reporting hospitalizations per 100,000 and hospitalizations per 100,000 over the past like 14 days, which has been incredibly useful. Thank you, Vera. You're absolutely right. Um, I would like to see a push to do more of that in Wikipedia. So I would love to see this map. And if I can make Microsoft Paint work, I'll do it because um, it should be cases per capita. Um, the pandemic info box is not one I ever really wanted to be using, but I am now. Um, and th this is particularly useful because it defines, you know, index case and it defines arrival date and it has the official website. So Illinois' article is like less of a mess than many. And this is like a huge mess, right? So in a lot of these articles, California being one of the worst offenders is it'll say on X day, all these counties announce new cases, and that's just unreadable. So things that should be included here, you know, are like the first few cases of like, where are they? Important landmark cases. So for example, the first case in Lake County, the first case in a major downtown Chicago building, you know, when did people start closing things? When was the first child infected? When was the first death? Stuff like yeah. that. Unfortunately, this is like a side effect of a lot of Way Wikipedia articles are written is that people will add their one fact that they just read, right. and it becomes a timeline. It becomes a series of bullet points, exactly. Exactly. And, we, and we need good editors to come along and synthesize all this information into a readable format, like you said. Exactly. So one thing that I've been doing personally, and or at least something that I'm working on, it's a huge project, is to condense all of this into like tables that show new cases or cumulative cases per day. And we've started doing that. Um, and I would love to share a cool little thing with you guys. I don't know where I put it. Um, 
So these medical charts, is this showing up? No, it's not. Shoot. OK, I guess I'm just going to have to go here because I don't know how to screen share. And y'all don't need to see 800 tabs that I have open. So this is an interesting way of presenting this chart, right? Normally, we see epidemiologic curves tilted 90 degrees to the left. So I'm not sure why we're doing it this way, but we are. It's fine. This is fine. <laughs> this is fine. <laughs> this is fine. But there's, you can see that there's case charts for everywhere, you know, in the U.S. There's case charts for a lot of places, but in a, a couple of places, and I'm trying to find exactly where, they're also mirrored on commons and on Wikidata, which is really interesting to me. Um, so let me see. Uh, yeah, I remember Doc James um, mm -hmm. asking about how we might be able to consolidate tabular data like that rather than copying it over right. across. Right. So, so I think that we're going to need a better solution than what we have right now, which is kind of kludged together, as Wikipedia so often is. Um, you know, I think Wikidata having cumulative case counts, right, is really, really helpful. So this is the main Wikidata item for mm. this. So if you go to 2020 coronavirus pandemic in the United States, love all of these different names for it. That's great. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, and then number of deaths by point in time. This is a really useful way to tabulate data. Um, I do wish that there was an easier way for us to tabulate, um, like automatically generate distribution maps with per capita right. deaths, per capita cases. Um, this number of cases over time is invaluable when one's attempting to either put together um, like a new cases per day table the way that I've been trying to do or really just for anyone trying to look back because the problem we're running into or at least I'm running into and that I as a like medical professional uh, see <laughs> still getting used to that still getting used to that yeah um <laughs> is is that we're in a lot of places only putting um our current status in the article and we're not keeping track of where we've been and a lot of government websites are doing the same thing like there are a lot of places where they're just changing the number every morning and the internet mm -hmm. archive is doing their best but they're missing some right. um i don't know if the tables are stored in a lua module i don't know what that is i don't know <laughs> what i don't know <laughs> it sounds important though i do people on <laughs> computers uh, so if anyone has the answer please let us know because that would be super interesting i think um, the, the the solution lies in lua i know that much i don't know sure. where they are stored but everyone points to lua as the scripting language that'll do it cool yeah. and meanwhile in new jersey they're looking for COBOL programmers <laughs> oh boy oh boy um so anyways i find i find it really interesting how we're attempting to tabulate data in a lot of different places and in a lot of different ways. Right. Um, the other thing that I find really interesting is, let me see if I can, coronavirus pandemic in the Netherlands has a really interesting way of doing articles. So um, this is oh my this goodness. is a great map. This is my favorite oh, yeah. map that anyone has. No. <laughs> I. It was just there. It's just there. Give it back. <laughs> Try it again. Um, just click on it again. Let's see what happens. Oh, I'm sad now. Um, <laughs> this is we just look at it here. Look at the thumbnail and be sad. For 10,000 inhabitants by municipality. This is the kind of map that everything should have. And given that we're starting to get more granular data in the US, you know, down to the zip code, this is the kind of thing that we should be looking at creating, which yeah. is very cool. Um, so again, don't really understand why we have the epidemiologic curve on its side. I don't know how to computer, so I'm not going to change that. But this is really nice because you can change it. Oh, wow. Yeah, this is nifty. Loving this. Um, they also have had, so this is a really nice curve, right? Confirmed cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. Um, growth rate of confirmed cases so new confirmed cases and you can change it from log to linear um which you know epidemiologists love love us a log scale 
Um, and then new confirmed cases per day. This is one of the more useful things that we're not seeing created everywhere. And I mm -hmm. don't really know who made this, but it's very lovely and we should make them for everything. Yeah. Um, this actually had a different um, format earlier where it had new cases by um, province by day. And I think I understand that this is going to become unwieldy um, if we do it for multiple months at a time as this pandemic is going to last longer. Um, but having them by month, I think, is really useful. Um, please don't delete my templates. You can, like, remove them. But please don't delete them <laughs> did I you work on these them. templates here? Not these ones here. The ones in California I did. Um, I can show you my beautiful template. Um, <laughs> I'm very proud of it. Unless someone already deleted it, which is fine. I guess I'm an admin. I can undelete stuff. <laughs> Not that I would ever use an admin. Vera, Vera says overlay with the map of religion in the Netherlands. And there might be some correlation, perhaps. Cool. Oh, yeah. I wonder if they're having some of the same problems that we're having in uh, oh, America, God. where the folks of like, certain religions are insisting on congregating. And right. so I wonder if we'll see a, a disparities in religion and uh, the number of cases that you get. Right. Yeah, there was. We were watching on the news yesterday. Um, so this is the thing that I made: is new cases in California by county for March. This is much more readable than the uh, mm -hmm. just mess of text. So this is the mess of text. Oh, uh, yeah. No one's that, gonna wow. That actually wow. covered, and this this table covers everything that is in the mess of text below. Wait. So you edited that, that table? I made this table yesterday. In Visual yeah. Editor. Or... In visual editor, actually. Okay. Thank goodness. Um, <laughs> of course, yeah. I am, you know, I I am actually uh, mixed on visual editor because I grew up literally on wiki edit, like text source editor, whatever they're calling it these days. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that for a table that has like forty columns and fifty two rows, visual editor rules. Yeah, tables um, were the first thing that converted me to using Visual Editor because they're so much person. easier to, to right. edit tables. There's no other way. It has to be the way. Yeah, so so that was really, that's the only reason I could do it in like a day. Um, but one of the things that, like this this article is the exemplar of people just adding tidbits by tidbits by tidbits. Um, and so which is valuable to a point, whacker. but we also need that synthesis and we are definitely not seeing it this here. Is, this is useless. Yeah. <laughs> now at the time it was useful, you know? Um, so as we move on, I feel like, you know, one, one month at a time, we need to go back and prune the past yeah. because, because it is right. such a dynamic situation. Um, like this is all really useful of like when, when did people change their guidelines and what has the government response been on, you know, different times and days. So I may go at this with a weed whacker if someone else doesn't get there first. <laughs> um, yeah, please. Oh. It's really but unreal. what's interesting, Emily, is that I love this contrast of the fact that you were doing this newsletter as, you know, we weren't sure this was a pandemic, at least on the scale that we know of today, oh, right? No. And that's probably why you saw drip, drip, cup full, right. bucket full, not yet deluge, but you were trying to keep up with a more traditional newsletter sense mm -hmm. of doing your newsletter. So I think it's, well, it is interesting to see. Friends. Yeah. You, know? you did it for yeah. friends. You did it for folks like, you know, and it's really cool. And this is kind of interesting because it's kind of old school and I love watching you do it kind of in real time. Yeah, I didn't yeah. even think about this. I didn't even think about this until like 10 minutes ago when you kind of explained why you transitioned from mm -hmm. newsletter to Wikipedia. So I'm going to put out something that to, to have you chew on because you know I'm no fan of Wiki News, but know, what I'm thinking is that no, no, did you no. just prove <laughs> that the Wiki News approach, which is what you were basically doing with the newsletter, just collapses on itself at some point? Uh, there's no need to insult her newsletter like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but she said it herself. Go ahead. No, no, you're right. You're right. It's un it's an unsustainable model, um, and especially when someone like me who grew up with Wikimedia, it's it's not sustainable. Um, and like if i was feeling burned out and tired which i became more and more frequently right. um there was no one else to pick up the slack 
And the great thing about Wikimedia is I can pick up the slack for you, you can pick up the slack for me. Right. And the scale of the collaboration means that we can do this everyone, everywhere, and have a type of not just granularity, but clarity to data that nothing else in the world can do. Yeah. Right. And minus, yes. <laughs> Love visual editor, especially for tables, um, especially for something as broad in scope and as wide ranging and as long ranging pandemic. Wikipedia is second to none in our ability to disseminate this information. The New York Times actually. Um, let me rescreen share something mm -hmm. um, that I have open in one of my 800 tabs please don't judge right. me no go ahead go ahead and find um, it and i think one of the things that is interesting i think because I, because not yeah, only yeah. you but we had a few other folks in our community that actually made products outside the wiki sphere so ed superior mm -hmm. has a pretty well read um guide like a handbook about reporting on COVID 19 and it's all done on google docs like a whole network of google docs and what i think is kind of interesting be he, interesting to hear your take i think maybe part of the problem of not necessarily jumping in in the early part of covering something in Wikipedia is you're not even, not even sure what to call it. You're not even sure how the, yeah. the titles of the articles are. You don't even know where to find them. And this is something that's interesting, at least on the English front, like we actually have three major articles for this phenomenon, right? We have the virus, the disease, and then the pandemic. They're three different articles. Right, because they're three completely different phenomena. Right. And as a not quite physician, I'm in this weird limbo because I don't have any more <laughs> rotations because they've all been canceled because there's not enough masks for medical students. Uh, so I'm, yeah, it's very weird. I'm like a doctor, but not a doctor. Right. Weird. Um, so I'm just going to say as a almost doctor, um, <laughs> it's heartening to see us split these phenomena out because, you know, SARS-CoV-2 is a virus with its own virology. It's an right. interesting little, little dude, um, you know, and and like SARS-CoV-1, um, it will be studied for however long virologists are interested in it. Um, right. COVID-19 is the specific disease caused by SARS-CoV-2 the same way that, you know, we SARS, 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 SARS OG SARS, SARS-1. <laughs> SARS-2003. Uh, SARS-1. SARS, <laughs> SARS uh, yeah. Um, is, is caused by SARS-CoV-1, right? Or, you know, measles, the disease is caused by measles virus, the virus. It's called measles virus. <laughs> That's the name. It's really lame. Um, you know, we need to have separate articles for separate phenomena. And then the pandemic, like, God forbid, if SARS-1 were to come back, we wouldn't call it SARS-2. We would call it, you know, the 20-whatever, 20-never um, pandemic, right? The 20-whatever SARS-CoV-1 pandemic, right? Right. Um, also, the many discussions I've had with infectious disease specialists and virologists saying how there's another SARS out there. Uh -huh. Concerningly prophetic. Right. Yeah, I remember when I first ran into it, I I didn't realize there was that distinction because I, I'm mm -hmm. not sure if it's still the case, but German Wikipedia doesn't have three articles. It only has two. Interesting. I, yeah, I think the the I'm not sure exactly which two were blended, but I think the outbreak and the disease were blended and the virus was its own thing. And that's when I first saw it as SARS COVID two, whatever COVID SARS two or something like that. SARS and COVID. C O V two, yeah, and I was like, what? I think they got a typo. It's not SARS, and I realized, oh, it is. It's just a different type of it, right? Well, the original email I got, like, I I'm on a bunch of infectious disease mailing lists because, of course, I am. Um, <laughs> said SARS like or SARS type pneumonia, mm -hmm. so that's kind of where we've been calling it. Um, I will, yes, shingles is not caused by herpes virus because herpes virus or herpes viridae is a family of viruses. Shingles is caused by the varicella zoster virus, um, which is one of the many hu human herpes viruses. There's so many of them, you guys. So <laughs> and by so many, I mean there's like eight. Right. Um, so let me share this uh, thing from the New York Times right now, which I think is like the closest to 
the closest, not useful, but like the most comprehensive effort. Mm -hmm. So they've got this thing where they're mapping every case. Oh, oh wow. Oh, my. County. It's beautiful. Um, they have a GitHub situation where they have all of the cases listed by counties. So mm -hmm. you can hit show all counties. Like, this is what needs to be in Wikidata. However, yeah. and I have, I, I have a list of all their sources. So, like, it's right. not like we can't be doing this. Um, but I think the future for us is going to be cases by day because that will be what people seek in the future is that right. kind of epidemiologic information. Um, and there's a, a large part of me that's thinking for the future here, not just what will people want to know? What do people want to know now? What will people want to know? But also what will this data be for in the future? And sorry, New York Times, I know y'all have made your coverage free, but Wikipedia is free forever. Wikidata is free forever for yeah. everyone. Yeah. And when this is all history, our stuff will continue to be free forever. So I want to make sure that we have the same quality and same granularity. And permanently, um, that's a really good point, because a lot of times when newspapers do these big projects, they stay on the Internet for three, four five years and then absolutely yeah. disappear. There's a famous right. case of a newspaper in Colorado. They won a Pulitzer for this huge web um, web based story that they did with um, hundreds of different interlocking stories and maps and all this stuff. And they can't recreate it. They took the website yeah. down, the paper got sold, and it's basically on a on a CD ROM in some reporter's garage right now. Right. And that's shameful. Exactly. It, through no fault of I think any of the people involved, right? Except for, you know, the forces of capitalism or whatever. But we have like it all comes back to the sense of duty that I personally have always felt with regards to Wikipedia and Wikimedia. It's something that we are creating not just for ourselves, but for our future and for others. Um, and I think keeping that sense of duty in mind will make what we create not just comprehensive, but useful. Um, and I think it, it needs to be a combined effort between Wikidata, Wikipedias, um, all yes, yes to all the Wiki, Wikipedias, <laughs> Wikipedia, maybe? Um, <laughs> And, you know, commons. What do you think yeah, well, is keeping us from doing something like this? Is it expertise? Real. Is it resistance to the to new tools? I don't think there's any resistance. I think the community is doing its best to do this right now. Um, the COVID task force that, and the wiki project that sprouted up were like the most Wikimedia things that I've ever seen, right? It's the same phenomenon right we know how to cover big things like this i think the problem is just scale it's a huge scale this is a worldwide pandemic the scale of which we have not seen in a very very long time maybe maybe a de maybe a century maybe longer and you know time will tell but this is the biggest certainly the biggest public health event that Wikimedia has ever attempted to cover. And I think not only will this be a reckoning for our political forces, but it will be hopefully not a reckoning, but a point of growth and a point of pride for us um, in how we approach this. And when this happens again, because it will happen again, that there is a cyclical nature to zoonosis and pandemic that has only been accelerated by our increasing connectedness, um, we'll know how to do it again because we'll have this model. And I don't mean to be all doom and gloom, like, oh, we're all going to have like a terrible time with a pandemic again. I, I really, that's just how this works is we, yeah. we are connected and diseases travel. Um, so by doing it well this time, not only will we provide data and provide information for those researchers who are looking at this in the future and for people who you know, want to look back on it, we, we will also have a model for how to do this again in the future, which I think is going to be critical the next Absolutely. time this happens. Yeah. And, and the bright spot, and I don't think it's all doom and gloom. I think that, you know, 
bad things are inevitable. But one of the bright spots of what's been happening now is I see so many people rising to the occasion, not just Wikipedians, but people in everyday life. You know, it's like I'll go to the store and everyone's keeping their distance and everyone's chill and polite. And, yeah. uh, you know, and online, everyone's um, doing their best to reach out to their students or to other people to to help each other. And so that is really nice to see. And I think that we'll, uh, you know, and if we have to do this again, I think uh, we'll hopefully have learned something from what we're going through now. Yeah, I mean, I'd rather not have to do this again. Oh, yeah, in of course. My lifetime. <laughs> like, that would suck. It would suck a lot. Um, but I think if, if we do, we'll know how. And, you know, my classmates are helping, right? Yeah. My everyone that I know is helping somehow in some way. And it's really, really amazing to see. Like one of my classmates has gotten attention on NPR for her, her work in galvanizing medical students to volunteer. Like Mr. Rogers said, look for the helpers. Um, can you put Jim Hayes's comment up? Oh yeah. I didn't see that. Um, so Jim, this is a really good question. And I think there's a few things that we need and I think we're doing quite well given this the scale. I think the next time this happens, we'll need to have a decent post-mortem on the COVID-19 project and the task force um, to see what worked well, what didn't work well. One of the things that I think is fantastic is, um, can I screen share again? Sure. Um, so Wiki Project COVID-19, join it now. It's great. Um, <laughs> I don't think I'm actually formally in it. Whoops. So this is this is Wiki Project COVID-19, right? Um, also, there's already general sanctions on it, which like, come on, y'all. Come on. Come on. <laughs> um, one of the one of the best things about this project is the case count team name, right? Or the team task force, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Um, so this has, I know my battery's running low, back off. Um, so this talks about the data, temp it has data templates to maintain, and even more importantly, it has locations, sources, and adopters. So you can see who has taken responsibility for updating a certain thing, and you can know who to ask. Wow, wow. That's, that's cool. That's really cool. Um, wow. I also appreciate that they are putting like translations because <laughs> when I was working on the newsletter, I had to figure out a lot of like, how do you say dead person in Norwegian? Because <laughs> oh, I only speak, you know, English and French and Spanish. So anyways, I think it's a, I think it's a good question to be asking. I'm not sure we know the answer yet. I don't think we'll know what we need until this mm -hmm. is kind of done. I think right now we're doing it really, really well. Did you see this also? Uh, did you see that someone had made a short digestible version? I don't know if this is Netta. It was Netta. It was Netta. Yeah. She's amazing. Shout out to Netta. Yeah, this is something we need to see more of on our projects is that are things like this. Because yeah. we end up with, everyone wants to contribute and that's fantastic. But we end up with these gigantic walls of text. <laughs> And this is this is what people need right now are things right. like like this, like what we're seeing on the screen. Right. So to, to tell folks, this is what happened was um, Netta initiated the creation of a very short, but I don't want to necessarily say complete, but very succinct and gives you the 10,000 foot view primarily for the uh, job of translation. So, you know, probably the 30 most popular Wikipedia editions have plenty of article editors to map over almost everything. But how about the smaller ones? You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's such a task to see 30 pages, like, Oh my God, where do I start to translate this 30 page document? And this is great. It's like, no, there's one page Pre translate this first. Yeah. And then suddenly you're, you've got your leg up and you've got something there. Yeah. So if nothing else, this is something you could quickly translate into the language of the Indian subcontinent or into right. Gaelic or whatever. And for those of us like me who speak a couple languages really well and a couple not so well, <laughs> it's something a little more digestible to approach, which I appreciate as someone who speaks several languages very badly. 
Yeah, so this is pretty amazing that I saw that. And, and thanks for showing that, Emily. I had no idea people were kind of signing up in that chart to say, here's how to find me and here's what I'm working on. That's really great. That's not that common in our projects. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. And you can tell I've been enjoying kind of going through the histories of articles to see kind of who, and the histories of the case tables in particular, to just see who has kind of taken it. It's right. One of the yes, everybody go read Netha's blog post. It's great. Yes. Netha's great. We love Netha. Um, you know, it, it's interesting in that I'm always talking about how Wikipedia is Wikimedia, but particularly Wikipedia is bureaucracy born of anarchy. Um, <laughs> you get me drunk oh, I'm writing that down. That's brilliant. <laughs> I, I, I'm Wikipedia. I will talk to you about how Wikipedians are born, not made, and how Wikipedia is bureaucracy born of anarchy, like four hours. Andrew can verify this. This has happened on multiple occasions. Um, this is what Wikimedia is like with me. Um, but this is one of the rare occasions where it's not just bureaucracy born of anarchy, it's the anarchy of Wikimedia at its best where everybody is kind of stepping in where they're needed and taking on responsibility and the work gets done. Um, so maybe I need to back off on the bureaucracy born of anarchy. <laughs> but then I look at the Artcom page and I'm like, never mind, never mind. Right. This is a comment from Jan. Jan. He used a short version to translate the article about testing to Swedish, which is awesome. Yes. Good. And it's great to see you know, I don't know if you, you've probably seen this as well, Emily, that, you know, they've been trying to do better with medical professionals and how to communicate clear and less techy, <laughs> right? Same thing with like legal, legal documents too, trying to make oh, it more accessible to the general public. Right? Well, and one of, one of the things that I find mm, not quite frustrating, interesting, <laughs> followed by frustrating is when how medical students in particular contribute to wikimedia this is, this is tangent is that cool yeah i mean this, is, this podcast is all about tangents um <laughs> so some popular things among medical students are their particular resources for prepping for your medical boards because they're these huge tests that you have to take and they're terrible and they take over your life um and a lot of people use mnemonics um and other like memory devices to remember like mostly irrelevant pieces of information like if you ask any med student what get smashed means they'll be like oh yeah pancreatitis duh but that doesn't belong in wikipedia articles at all <laughs> and you find them everywhere and it's um which is i i nuke them with abandon whenever i see them but that that is kind of one of the problems that we run into is not just trainees but also um, professionals not knowing the appropriate tone in which to contribute. Right. Interesting. Yeah. So if you see a mnemonic on a medical article, nuke it. <laughs> you will have that appreciation. That's insider knowledge that shouldn't be. Just turn them into redirects. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought maybe I could uh, ask for your knowledge, Emily, one of the many things you've done in your years as a Wikimedian <laughs> was being the first Wikimedian in residence at the Center for Disease Control. Oh, I was. That is true. National oh Institute God. of Occupational Occupation Safety and Health. Safety and, health. Um, and this is yes. a weird, another weird connection is that I was the one who first had the meetings with the CDC for this um, thing. And we had the, the meeting and I've never had a partner, you know, take a recommendation and execute every single one of those recommendations. So I first had a meeting with the CDC um, a number of years ago because they want advice on how to engage better with Wikipedia. And they said, we have all this research, but it's not really being reflected out there in the popular uh, texts. And so they said, well, how do we do better in this area? And I said, well, there's three things you should do. One is you should have a conference. Two, mm -hmm. you should hire Wikimedia in residence. And three, you should release your stuff you know, and upload it and put it on Wikimedia. And they did all three. And the first person they hired was you as the Wikimedia in resident. So yeah, I hired James Hare and then now John Sadowski works for them. That's right. Um, so it's, and even when I left, cause I had to go to medical school, um, the program continued, which is unusual, I think for a Wikipedia in residence where the program continues after the original person has moved on. 
Right. Um, but I know way too much about N95s. Like, who? I know way too much about PPE. Um, well, that's what I was, think- that's what I I was thinking. Because uh, yeah. <laughs> didn't John Fedowski write this article, or was that you? No. So what happened was there was no mm-hmm. article about N95 masks. It was a redirect to yeah, yeah. the CDC and IOSH guidelines. So yeah. I created the N95 mask article with like two lines. Some folks added some more stuff. And then John Sadowski from NIOSH went, oh, well, what you want is this. <laughs> and so it was NIOSH stuff, which is awesome because this is a rating that NIOSH oversees, right? The N95 rating, right? Right. And N95s, not, they actually have a super interesting history, which I won't bore you with. <laughs> but, um, it, you know, it's a lot of articles like this. And I, one of the things that James Hare and I did was, um, you know, make sure that chemicals of occupational interest um, or common occupational exposures were included in wiki data and kind of setting that up. Um, right. And for the record, just so everybody knows, OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, is different than NIOSH. NIOSH does the research, OSHA makes the rules, and the CDC oversees NIOSH. But NIOSH is not the CDC. Just clarifying, because it confused me. Wait, NIOSH is not OSHA, you mean, or NIOSH? Mm-hmm. And NIOSH is part of the CDC. Right. But NIOSH and OSHA are completely different. Right, right. And NIOSH is Which the is... only one in D.C. The rest of the CDC is in Atlanta, right? Yes, NIOSH is in D.C. So this is Atlanta, cool. Is that... not a great place to be right now. Yeah. Nor is the... <laughs> so you can see CDC, NIOSH. So, so don't be surprised if you see lots of CDC, NIOSH content all over uh, Wikipedia. Yeah. But they've got... All the stuff, which is public domain, right? It's all public domain, yeah, which is really cool. Right. Um, and they have they have the excellent uh, mustache diagram that I'm sure people have seen of like Hitler mustache. Okay. Oh, that was them. Oh. Yeah, that's Nyash. Yeah, you can have a Hitler mustache if you want to wear an N95, but you can't have a Rob beard. <laughs> uh, be a yeah, Rob, you'd be in big trouble. Sorry. Oh, well, yeah. it's a good thing I don't leave my house. I'm, I'm going to yeah. see how long I can get this. Maybe I won't be able to fit out the door by the time this is over. <laughs> yeah, I mean, leaving the house is overrated. I think this is also oops, cloth face mask, I think. Face mask? Cloth there we mask go. should be a redirect to cloth face mask. Yeah, we should make a redirect there. Oh, we could do it live. Um, live but actually, this is also an article that John Sadowski created yeah. using CDC and IOS content, too. Mm-hmm. NIOSH is awesome, and they have been one of the most um, responsive agencies, which has been a, like that. That that has been such a not an outlier, but a joy in mm-hmm. terms of scientific content. No, I just learned something interesting from that I didn't know before from the uh, cloth face mask article. Is apparently during the nineteen eighteen flu pandemic, mm-hmm. a lot of people were wearing wearing masks in public. I hadn't yeah. learned that before. There were actually a lot of um, really popular photos, like the one in this article, but that were where physicians, which pictured physicians wearing masks. And the whole history of masks is fascinating because it started out as basically a bunch of like gauze, you know, um, and then Lian Te Wu working against the bubonic plague and how his uh, adversary decided that, oh, I didn't need masks. No one needs masks. I'm not going to get the plague. And then proceeded to die of the plague very quickly. And Dr. Wu did not die of the plague. Um, There's going to be so many little plague doctors running around this Halloween. (laughs) Pretty grim. (laughs) I mean... Yeah, yeah, but we won't be able to trick or treat. I guess we could just throw candy out the window. (laughs) I don't know. I hope we'll we'll be able to trick or treat by October. I really hope so. Well, I mean, what's been fascinating about this whole saga is that once you're so conscientious about having to wash your hands everywhere, you realize before coronavirus how just unsanitary our general yes. habits yes. were before. Oh that men are starting to wash their hands after leaving the bathroom is like, <laughs> on the one hand, thanks to the apocalypse. On the other hand, ew. Right. But there's also a phenomenon in medical school where you take microbiology and you either just like become totally laissez-faire about everything or you swing really hard into oh my god everything is germs wash everything right. always right 
And well, what's amazing of- is yeah, the germaphobes and the disaster preppers are having their 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 day now, right? They've all been very much vindicated by what's been happening. Have they? So really, <laughs> well, not, the, not the gun preppers though. The like, I have a bunch of beans and also a bunch of fabric, and I know how to sew preppers. <laughs> that. Yeah, interesting. So, what other articles related to coronavirus have you seen? created that are kind of interesting. So I, I was, I was like, wow, all these NIOSH related articles, this makes complete sense, right? Also after 9-11, NIOSH mm-hmm. had a major role in terms of all the particulates people were inhaling after 9-11 and everything, right? So. Yeah, they, they still, they still do. Um, something that's been interesting is all the lists of impacts. So for example, impact of the 2019-20 coronavirus pandemic on the cannabis industry, like. There's an article on that? There's also an article on impact of, on abortion in the United States due wow. to Texas banning abortions and Alabama saying, fuck you, For which is weird. I feel like I live in the upside down times because Alabama is like defending abortion rights. But yeah. Wow. Um, well, we can then, look at this one. This is one that I was I thought might be interesting related to at least what Rob and I work on, which is the impact of the coronavirus on arts and culture. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of interesting. This is created by Liam Wyatt and has quickly become like a, a very long list of impacts by country and everything. It's kind of interesting. I smell some sub articles. (laughs) (laughs) I know for a fact, a major glam organization, a museum system, has used this article to t- to send it to their higher ups to say, this oh, wow. is why we need to keep funding the arts now because look at we're getting hammered yeah. right yeah so. wow. But you're right. If you go to the bottom here, you'll see all these. Look at this. It's a gigantic yeah. nav box now where impacts. Yeah. There's our impacts right there. Right. Oops. Actually, yeah, it's actually in the info box there too, if you want to go from there. Socioeconomic impact. So it's kind of a. Oh, uh, suggested that this be merged into this. Merged? It should be, it's so large, it should be split up. <laughs> I know, I'm about to say, this is not the time to merge. There's a lot of stuff out there. It's a coronavirus yeah, this recession. Is the time to, this is the time to split. Let us split the articles. Right. Let me show you what I just saw. This one. So there's all kinds of, and for folks new to Wikipedia or or not used to seeing this, this is classic of what happens when we're trying to cover all the fast changing things in the in the world. Is that you people saying no, they should be merged. No, they should be split. They should be named this. They should be named that. And this is the the messier <coughs> part of our movement. Right? Which or my, I, sh- I should say dynamic. Out. What's that? <laughs> I'll be interested to see how it all shakes out. But yes, dynamic is the word I've been using, not <laughs> uh, dumpster fuck. Yeah. Or cluster fuck. <laughs> Sorry, I had to get one last cut in there. So it'll be interesting to see whether coronavirus recession will stay the title or someone one proposed to change a 2020 global recession. Yeah. Mm, I don't know about that one. It's not a very long article as it is now. So. One that I did create, which might be interesting for you folks to see, not medical related, is. Bah, 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 bah. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, not this again. <laughs> so, Zoom bombing, yes. It's a thing, unfortunately. No. Yeah. I found a so good un- screen. Which I might use for evil, but right. Yeah, I need to get one of those because uh, everyone has all these cool backgrounds but me. <laughs> I have the whiteness of my room. Yeah, so it's been interesting seeing that that uh, ripple effect, not just medical phenomena, but kind of other kinds of effects. This is quite interesting. Any reaction to this? Oh, CDC NIOSH. So there's John Sadowski at work again. <laughs> This was a redirect originally created by Doc James in 2015. 
Yeah. Can and we talk was, about droplets? Mm -hmm. And it was left as a redirect for like five years until just this past week, it was made a standalone article, which seems to make sense given how much emphasis there is on this now. What can yeah. you tell us about respiratory droplets and what you know of the transmission of well, the coronavirus? So, so coronaviruses, coronaviridae in general, are transmitted by respiratory droplets. So the couple of strains that come around every winter and cause the colds and general garbage um, are transmitted by droplets. So droplets are like sneeze kind of like when you sneeze and you get wet that's respiratory droplets gross right. um an aerosol is finer particles so those are created um by like intubation or i guess that says flushing toilets which is true mm -hmm. um and some aerosols are produced the question with any new virus is how is it transmitted whether by droplets or by aerosol because that tells the kind of protection that you're going to need. So for example, if someone comes in and they have TB or measles, that's aerosol. They need to be on negative pressure, so a room that sucks up all the air in it and slams the door shut and you have to go through an anti room and all of that and you have to wear an N95 or papper, um, which is like one of the weird space hood things. Um, or is it transmitted by droplets, like for example, respiratory syncytial virus? Um, mm -hmm for which you really just need like a surgical mask or a procedure mask. Um, because as long as no one's sneezing directly into your face and you're covering the points of entry, you're fine. Mm -hmm. um, and there's been some question about how is SARS-CoV-2 transmitted? Um, is it only droplets or can it be aerosolized? And is it more dangerous in one form or the other? And we're still working on that. And by we, I use the royal scientific we. <laughs> So when we say airborne, is that that's not a very precise term, right? Because airborne means aerosol precautions. So when mm -hmm. we say someone's on droplet or airborne precautions, there those are the signs outside the door in the hospital. So right. droplet, there's contact precautions, droplet precautions, and airborne precautions. Contact precautions is for stuff like C difficile diarrhea or you know, weird MRSA or whatever. <laughs> Not weird MRSA. There's just MRSA. There's not right. weird MRSA. That's not weird. No Scientific name, weird. weird version. Yeah. Please don't make a weird article called weird MRSA. Oh. So what what do you see? What would you like to see? So we, we've come up with tabular data, still a big weakness in our ecosystem. We yeah. were at, Rob, you were at Wikidata with me, or Wikidatacon, right, where they had an explicit question or maybe you weren't there, but they had an explicit question saying, can we use Wikidata for tabular data? And basically the Wikidata folks said, that's not really what it's made for. So we are missing this capability in some way. And it could be this crisis that compels us to do that better. So interestingly, we do have the capability. Um, there is, I swear I just saw it. Um, the, there is a um, article that has some stuff about California split out because apparently we aggressively have been splitting things, which makes me happy. The mm -hmm. article on California's pandemic has 397 citations right now. Ooh, um, that's um, about as much as the Martin Luther King article. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is what happens when you are in. Yeah. Um, so, so Jan says there is a data data namespace in Commons. Data. Mm -hmm. So it's in the data namespace. Thank you, Jan. Um, so there there's like a data namespace for cases by day in several places. It's really cool. Um, let me. I, I want to see if I can find it so I can show everybody. It's not very intuitive and it's not very readable, but it does work. <laughs> um. Let's see if we can see this. I saw it originally, but I don't know why it's not showing up now. Am, okay. I, am I too close or too far? Let's see. I don't know, but I oh. Did gosh. you see it flash? Something happened. So I found. I saw flash. I found a worse article than the California <laughs> I saw the last one. Part. Um. So this is the. If you let me screen share, I found oh, yeah, yeah. 
California County's article, which is just all of the content from the California article split out, so it's even mm -hmm. less readable. I, I'm just going to spend some time today fixing it. Um, but they have um, the daily case data that is um, split out from data space, which is cool. So for tabular data, it's on commons and it's in the data space. So you have date, new cases, total confirmed cases, hospitalized. So this is like what I, I have all this stuff in a spreadsheet sitting on my computer. Um, so something I'm personally going to work on is transferring that data into the data space in commons and Wikidata right. to make it at least more usable. Um, and what's interesting to me is like, this is all public domain and like this will be available as long as the servers continue to function. Nice. Oh, okay. So let me show that. It took a long time to load, as Jan said. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, so <laughs> don't reload. It takes 30 seconds. And I can't reloading it. So there we go. <laughs> Thank you for the warning. It takes some time to load. Yes. So what, what are the Dakotas doing right? That's what I want to know. Uh, um, being no sparsely one, populated? <laughs> yeah. Sparsely populated and having no one want to go there on purpose. Sorry, friends in South Dakota and North Dakota. No, they know. They know. They do have they have a lot of cases per capita. Right. Also, note the the circle of Kentucky in there. Or the, yeah, you know, they're doing. Uh, I heard that they were doing Kentucky smarter things than Tennessee was. Is balling. They're yeah. doing everything right, and they have been since the beginning. And really, oh yeah, uh, Governor Andy Bashir is like a new kid on the block, and he fucking rules. So one of the things that I noticed, I, like I started following, I mean, I've been following things in some detail since like December, the way I follow, like there's an Ebola outbreak right now, but nobody seems to care about that. FYI, there's an Ebola outbreak right now. Um, but I started following things in a lot of depth in March, like every case everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it's been uh, frustrating to see things come down the pike like louisiana mm. looks bad and it's going to get worse wow um you know and and kentucky's been doing well and they're going to continue to do well and you know florida is a trash fire yeah <laughs> I mean, florida man lives there yeah they elected him governor mm. yeah And Massachusetts looks like it's doing okay. Massachusetts is doing okay. Um, they're not quite having the rush of cases that New York is because they implemented like stay the fuck home orders a mm -hmm. lot earlier. Um, you know, and, and Pennsylvania had a weird county by county situation that they were doing and that kind of worked, but not as well as just statewide shut down. Um, and Ohio... Right surprisingly has been doing really well um governor something something dewine forget his first name sorry mm -hmm. uh, kind of looked like a crazy person two weeks ago right um because or not two weeks ago i don't even know how many weeks ago no, it was. two weeks ago yeah they said they canceled of, the whole school year really fast well no at the beginning of march he was like there's ten thousand cases in ohio <laughs> like everybody freak out and everyone was like oh, this guy's crazy but Actually, he was completely, first of all, he was right. We all knew he was right. And he shut down the state really early, which has drastically reduced transmission and saved right. a lot of lives. Um, and we're really seeing it in terms of like which states are running out of ventilators and which ones have enough. Um, I.e., hopefully Illinois still has enough ventilators. Right. Great. Well, thanks so much for walking us through all this. It's really fascinating. I mean, I... I knew that we had some tabular data content. It's it's pretty cool to see it's come this far in the ability to do things like this. And I hope we can do more because right now it is uh, not I being used widely. Well, we've got go, the free time. Speaking of the pandemic, I need to go pick up my grocery. So I will yeah. talk to you all later. Thank you so much okay. for having me. Be safe. All right. Bye. Thank you, Emily. Bye. All right. Great. 
So uh, thank you so much for joining us on the Wikipedia Weekly Podcast. We went a little bit longer than we wanted to, but that's because we found the tabular data and we had to look at it. So We do like um, our dark data. <laughs> um, so just to remind you, you are watching us on Facebook, on YouTube, on Periscope, and Twitch. We are part of the Wikipedia Weekly Network, and we will be doing more of this type of programming now that most of us are stuck at home and not exactly uh, engaging in face-to-face -face activities. There have been a number of conferences. This is kind of the prime time for conferences. I think we're actually supposed to be in the Berlin conference the, for this past week or something like that. Was yeah. That supposed to be now? Yeah. So I don't even you know, know what day it is anymore. So <laughs> I'll take your word for it. Yeah. So, you know, there's all these kinds of activities that we're trying to do online to replace the in real life. Yeah. And I think and, that, uh, for the most part, at least what I've seen, we all seem to be rising to the occasion. And so, you know, we'll, we'll muddle through this somehow. Yeah. And we'll use tools like this. This is a tool called StreamYard. And you'll see that we've surfaced comments coming from all different types of platforms, uh, like Jim here. Oh, good. They kept it from Facebook. Or you have something like James Hare. In theory, Wikimedia Commons stores tablet data is not a well implemented feature. So he's coming from YouTube. This is one of the rare tools that tries to be the Rosetta Stone of allowing YouTube people to talk to Facebook people, to talk to Twitter people. Um, so it's a pretty neat tool. And for any folks out there in the movement that might be interested in using it uh, in some way, similar to this, to replicate or to enhance what we can't do uh, with face-to-face -face meetups, that let us know. So Jan, uh, myself, Richard Nipel, We've been doing a lot of these types of uh, podcast episodes to get up to speed faster and also get more people talking within the movement. And the more you try it, the the more you realize the power of this tool. We yeah. even have a comment from Twitter. So stay oh, safe coming Twitter. from Twitter. Yes. Yeah, and I think this platform has a lot of potential. Um, but I think I might try using it as later this summer to do some workshop training workshops for Wikidata and Wikipedia. And we'll see uh, how that works out. But I see that this has a lot more functionality than Zoom and a lot more flexibility than Zoom and a lot of uh, LMS software that I've seen um, at schools like Blackboard and Canvas. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Yeah, the great news. The great news about this tool is that anyone can sign up for free and you'll be able to use it to stream to any of the platforms to try out with the only Real issue is that if you do use it in the free version, you will get this powered by StreamYard logo in the upper right-hand corner on all your content, which I think is fine just for playing with it. Yeah. But even the monthly cost is very reasonable for this. And even if you're not interested in purchasing the product or anything, so Jan, Richard, myself, we are looking for more folks from the movement who want to put content into the Wikipedia Weekly Network. You might have seen that there was some edit with me type of content that Jan did with Wikidata. We had one recently with Rebecca O'Neill from Ireland, and we were editing stubs uh, together and editing Wikidata. Uh, we we're looking for folks from different languages, from different locales, different types of programming, uh, and training as well. You know, short, maybe 15, 20 minute training modules where we're going to do Q and A's or office hours. So anything that you folks think of, get in touch with us. Let us know. We have, uh, I think we put this up here, our contact info. Um, down here. There we go. So Wikipedia Weekly Network on meta.wikimedia.org. Go ahead and look for that and drop us a note or find us on our social media channels, facebook.com slash group slash Wikipedia Weekly or twitter.com slash Wikipedia Weekly or search in YouTube for Wikipedia Weekly. Um, the channel name is not very pretty, but you can find it by looking up Wikipedia Weekly there. So Rob, thanks so much for coming on. No, and, no problem. Great time. Oh, as a suggestion here, would be nice to have a wiki map session. Um, yes, and definitely tools oriented stuff. You know, one thing that we're thinking of as well is let's spend like an hour showing you like the top ten wiki data games because not everyone has played them before, right? Yeah, um, it's, uh, this would be a great time to show off tools because I know I'm always, I've been doing this for 15 years. I'm still learning about new tools that I hadn't heard of before. Learned about one this afternoon. And so if people could come on and show up their mapping tools or whatever, that would be fantastic. Actually, yeah, that's a great point, Rob. I, I'm I'm thinking that we should have a whole episode just about how OSM or OpenStreetMaps, you know, works with Wikipedia or not, right? Like I'm a yeah. kind of a 
OSM user, but I really don't know all the ins and outs of how OpenStreetMaps works and how Wikimedians might get more involved with that project or the other way around. Yeah, me neither. I just know that it shows up when I do a, a Wikidata query and map it, and there's an OpenStreetMap, but I don't know anything else beyond that. And so that would be good to learn about, yeah. Right. Another thing that you might have noticed is that in the last 24 hours, there's been some outages on Wikipedia. I mean, some really oh, hard oh, database that night was, yeah. errors, correct. So that is something that um, is you know, not that common these days, but it unfortunately... Well, we're in new know, territory on the internet. You know, we're all, like, we're taxing everything as hard as we can. You know, I had to you know, I had to log into Netflix again. Oh, first world problems. Yeah. But yeah, no, we're, it's just an inevitable consequence. And, and I think that we're dealing with it pretty well. We meaning yeah. the foundation and the tech folks. I um, don't know whether this is it. Maybe this is it. I think this might be it. So here's one example of the um, bug report. Right. So this is the bug report that tracks this problem. So this is very, much more techy, but it says there is a database table that was dropped um, and that is not good. That is a big, big no-no. If like yeah, a, even a database that, table that. lost. <laughs> so one of the things that you might not have ever seen is Fabricator. So we're thinking one episode where we just even talk about Fabricator, what it is. Yeah, because I really is. think that this is impenetrable to new users and non-technically inclined users. And I think they right. try to make it accessible, but I think that maybe... Right. Some, hand, some explaining would be good for folks. Yeah, so is this useful? So for folks watching this, um, if you're interested in Fabricator or just a quick tour for average people, not techies, a quick tour for normal people, normal editors, what is Fabricator and what, why do people keep telling me, oh, you want something fixed? File it in Fabricator. You want a new feature? File it in Fabricator. What the heck is this tool? How do you use it? And why is it the, the point of entry for all this stuff? And it seems like there's some people who would be interested in seeing that. Yeah. Um, oh, and also one more comment here, showing how we integrate with other communities outside Wikipedia in different countries. That's a great idea. So not just OSM, but, you know, DBpedia, all these other projects out there. How do we work or not work with these types of folks? Yeah. Great. All right. So thanks so much. And join us on the podcast next time. We're going to have at least two more episodes this week. Um, we're going to talk to some of the folks that we might have talked about today related to COVID-19. We're going to try to talk to some folks in the glam world to find out how things are going on there. And we might have another one on the technology um, of Fabricator that we just talked about here. Right. So right. uh, stay safe, everybody, and stay inside your house for the love yes. of God. Stay, stay in. <laughs> Don't feel like you need to be hyperproductive. Just... Um, yeah, Do if something you use your time to contribute to Wikipedia, fantastic. If you don't, that's okay, too. Great. And thank you so much. And we are going to play us out of here.